Today we start a new series called Game Plan. And as we look at Game Plan, we are looking at ways that uh, we go into life with God's plan that give us a life that is higher, happier, holier, more hopeful than any other life. And today we're going to look at God putting us in to share our love. And we're going to start by recognizing that in whatever venue, it seems there are moments, some more intense, some less intense, there are moments for all of us where things just don't go as planned. As if I needed another example, the second half of a football game somewhere played in Colorado yesterday. Sometimes things just don't go as planned. And I think that's true in a variety of arenas of life. And today I want to focus on one specific arena, and that is the arena of marriage. I think the reality is that with our marriages, with the experience of relationships with our significant other, that there are moments where it doesn't go as anticipated. And sometimes we can identify reasons for that, and sometimes we're more challenged to identify specific and particular reasons. But I want to focus on that um, area of love, and I want to go back and start with a research project that George Barna did 10 years ago. And in that, he said, he wrote this, studies showing the importance and value of preparing for marriage seem to fall on deaf ears. America has become an experimental, experience-driven culture. Rather than learn from objective information and teaching based on that information, people prefer to follow their instincts and let the chips fall where they may. Given that tendency, we can expect America to retain the highest divorce rate among all developed nations of the world. What this is saying is that um, we cannot or do not typically learn from, rely on the experience of others around us. Rather, we have to individually and personally experience um, different aspects of marriage in order to learn from them. And therefore, we are often repeating the very same mistakes that others have made that have not helped their marriage. And we end up with unanticipated results in marriage. Kind of like the football bloopers we saw a few moments ago. I do not think any couple gets married with the hope and anticipation that they are going to experience challenges in their relationship. I think most of us would like that um, vision of what marriage looks like, um, Couples side by side walking into the future together. You can't see this on the other side, but they're both smiling. And they both have that sparkle in their eyes and they are both joyful. But we know that that is not always the case. That in some instances, marriage can be a struggle. 
And I think we can also say that most of us who are married, most who are looking forward to marriage someday in their life, would like that experience of a joy-filled, deeply loving, committing, committed relationship. And today I want to share with you part of what I believe is God's plan for that. And I'm going to say it simply right now, and I am going to expand on it in the next few minutes. Here's the simple. If you want to love your spouse more, if you want to have a more deeply loving relationship and marriage, the key is to love God more. The more we love God, the closer we draw to God, the more intimate we are in our relationship with God, the greater capacity and ability we have to love our spouse. Now, as I approach this today, I make no, no um, excuse. I'm going to approach the message today from a man's perspective, in part because of the obvious reason. However, I think what I'm going to share has application on both sides of a relationship for both a husband and a wife, a man and a woman, and it has application in other relationships. And I want to be very clear. I want you to hear this as a message of grace. I know that some marriages experience incredible challenges. There may be some here today who are experiencing those challenges in their relationship right now. I know that there are some who have done absolutely everything they could, and it just doesn't work out. This is not about condemnation or guilt. Don't hear that. This is about grace and how we move forward and take the next steps. And I think the next steps are to look into what God teaches us. And so I'm going to um, go back into the Old Testament in the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy. I'm going to start with verse one. This is um, conversation instruction from God into um, the people of Israel. Uh, they are planning the conquest of the promised land. And um, in my Bible, the title above this chapter says, um, Love the Lord your God. Here we go. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that your children and their children and after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear Israel and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them in the door frames of your houses and on your gates. In every way, the people are being stru instructed. Here it is. Here's the core. Here's the center. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength. Write it on your head. Tie it on you. Burn it into your skin, whatever it takes. Love the Lord your God with all your being in every way. Now, as we look at that love and then go into 1 John 4, hear these words. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we love God with all our being. God loved us. We also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. The message here is God's love is in us. And as we love God more, that love pours down and fills us up more and filled with the love of God, we're able to pour out and share that love with those around us, particularly and specifically with um, our primary relationship with our spouse, our significant other. If you want to love your spouse more, love God more, 
And that love will flow through and into. Now, as we look at a New Testament message, I want to ask, what do you, can some of you share, and this is a chance for you to talk, that's okay, what is the most common biblical passage that men um, use with their wives on marriage? Do you know where it is in the Bible? I'm seeing some smirks. You know what I'm talking about. Shout it out. Wives, submit to your husbands. There we go. Have any of you heard that? Yeah. Um, my grandfather, who was of a different generation um, by far, uh, had the ability to preach on that passage with passion and to cite and quote it often for some reason to the women in the family. I don't know why. <laughs> but that particular passage is found in Ephesians 5. And what is fascinating about that passage in Ephesians 5 um, is that it's not often used in weddings. I've officiated at about 300 weddings. I don't think I've had it at 15 of those. But we're going to have it today. So if you want to turn uh, your Bibles uh, to Ephesians 5, and I'm going to read starting in verse 21, um, where we read these words, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So in this passage, husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. When we unpack this and look at it, I, I think there's an interesting sequence that we miss. And this is what it looks like. We go to Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit your husbands as to the Lord. But right preceding that verse, the first thing that I shared, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This isn't about slavery. This is about respect and honor and harmony and working together. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And I think it gives a powerful message. Wives, submit to your husbands uh, as to the Lord. But I think the previous message is the powerful one. Can you go back to that by any chance? Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. We may want to focus on wives, submit to your husbands. But I think the powerful statement is right there. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. What does this look like? Well, first, I think it teaches us how do we love sacrificially. Now, Vince Lombardi said, football is like life. It requires perseverance, self-denial, hard work, sacrifice, dedication, and respect for authority. Let me read that again. Marriage is like life. It requires perseverance, self-denial, hard work, sacrifice, dedication, and respect for authority. Who's the church? 
Would everyone who is the church raise your hand? Them is us. We are them. The church is everyone who believes in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Christ loved the church, you and me, sacrificially. Think about the life that Christ led. You know, I got, I got to believe from everything I read in the Bible that heaven's a pretty good place, right? And that God is all-powerful. Can we agree on those two things? God so loved us that he gave his only son. Jesus came to earth, full God, true God, true man, we recite in the Nicene Creed, with all the authority and power of God, gave up his divinity for his humanity to spend 33 years roughly on earth with you and me so that we would know the love of God. So much did he love us that he gave all that up. He walked through this earth. And I imagine, even though the scripture doesn't say this, it would not surprise me to find out that Jesus went through some stuff like we go through. I imagine Jesus had the stomach flu, a sinus cold. He may have broken a bone. We don't have that in the scriptures. I understand that. But he experienced humanity. He didn't sin, but he experienced the burdens that we experience. He knows the brokenness of life. When he was in his early 30s, he went to be baptized by John the Baptist to take his stand on our side. And from that time forward, he proclaimed the love of God to all the people. There were several times in the scriptures where people had rocks in their hands. They were going to stone him. And he walked through without being killed. People rejected his message. Remember the rich young ruler that came to Jesus and said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, follow the commandments. And he said, well, I've done all that stuff since I was a kid. What's the real stuff? Well, go sell all that you have. Give it to the poor, then come follow me. And it says in one of the most tragic verses in scripture, the young man went away very sad for he had great possessions. He went away. Jesus was abandoned by his disciples at the foot of the cross. He was betrayed by one of his friends. He was scourged. You know what that means? That's a nice word. He was beaten. Beaten bloody. They took him up to Calvary's hill. They pounded nails through his flesh. He hung on a cross in humiliation where he experienced the death by slow suffocation. And from that very cross, he cries out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And at the end, he cried out, it is finished. And it was. And what was finished was sin's reign and the power of death to defeat us because Christ defeated death. He gave it all. He sacrificed. Husbands, are you willing to sacrifice for your wife? Are you willing to let the love of God pour through you to the extent that there are moments you put yourself second so you can put her first? I just realized how awkward this is standing here with my wife in the front row. <laughs> a little easier at nine o'clock. You know, she wasn't here. But it's a responsibility we all bear. To submit to one another out of reverence for Christ and to make sacrifice. To say no to self for the sake of other. To give that sacrifice of love in the ways that you are able. Christ loved us sacrificially. Are we as husbands, men, willing to sacrifice for the sake of our wife? That they too may know joy and peace that together we can submit to Christ sacrificially. Secondly, persistently, Tom Landry writes, a champion is simply someone who did not give up when they wanted. 
persistence. To keep at it. To never give up. I um, ask many couples who have been married 40, 50, 60 years, or some in this room, I've asked this question. I've, I asked two questions. Do you ever have a hard time in your marriage? Guess what they say? Yep. You betcha. They're usually not very, you know, discreet about it. Yes. And um, the second question I ask is, to what do you attribute the success of your marriage? We never gave up. I think every couple has tough times. Desert times. I don't think it's usually in the first couple of years. I think it takes a little while for that stuff to unfold. I can tell you that Deborah and I have been in the desert at some points in our marriage, and we look across and we can't even see each other from the distance it feels. And I'm not sure there are times we don't want to see each other. Does anyone understand what I just said? But we're persistent. We keep going after it. I know we have all these definitions for love. I mean, there's that one with sweaty palms, heart palpitations, stuff going on that's really exciting. But you know what I think the deepest definition of love is? Commitment. Another way of saying that is loyalty. When we said to death to his part, we got to figure this out, girl. And it's hard. But we always do. And that's the message I get from couples that have been married a long time. Persistence, loyalty, commitment. You know, Jesus never gave up on you. He is still with you today. He made the commitment, look, folks, I'm with you always. To the end of the age. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church persistently, loyally, with commitment. Finally, how do we love? Graciously. Recently, there was a wonderful story about one of our Huskers, Garrett Snodgrass. He was in Chipotle's having a meal when he looked out and he saw a homeless man there and he took him a burrito so that he would have a meal. People were just touched, rightly so, about that random act of kindness. Husbands, are you loving your wife graciously? Is there ever that random act of kindness? When was the last time you bought her a little gift? Not something incredibly expensive. That's not what I'm talking about but just something that might bring a smile to her face. Took her a fancy coffee at work so that she could drink it on what might be a tough day. Did you ever think of doing some kind of chore for her? You get up in the morning, you're downstairs, and you see that the dishwasher ran all night and it's clean. You can empty it yourself. I mean, you can do Wives, would you appreciate that? Any of you appreciate that? Yeah. We can do that. Or if there's dishes in the sink, you know, you don't, you don't have to be a woman to wash dishes, men. Do you all know that? Boy, it got quiet in here. Oh, no. And out of the little things, there are some big things. I want to tell you something that I'm going to pay for later today. But I'm going to tell you right now. Deborah's messed up. She is not perfect. She is a sinner, and she is broken. She's almost as bad as her husband. We are not a perfect couple. We do not have a perfect marriage. I think we have a great one. I think we have a good one. We even like each other. But we're not perfect. And there are times where we mess up. 
There are times when our mouths get ahead of our brains. There are times when sometimes we get silent when we should talk. There are times where we just don't think. Men, do any of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you, you just move forward without that. No, yeah. We don't think. We mess up. There are times we get angry. The whole range of human emotions. From the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Are we willing to love graciously and to forgive? And I don't mean that kind of forgiveness where you're keeping a list over here. I forgave Deborah for this, this, and this, and this. Boy, I'm due for a big one now. I'm talking about the kind of forgiveness where you take it and you bury it in the deepest part of the deepest section of the ocean. You put a big sign over it. No fishing. It's gone. You leave it alone. Forgetting what lies behind, says the Scripture, we press on toward the upward call of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We press on for the sake of of the life that we can share together because of Christ. Now I know that the vast majority of what I've said today really relates to men trying to be good or better husbands. I think there's a little application that can go both ways. And I think there are some things that can translate into other relationships in our lives. But if we want that kind of picture perfect in our own minds, family, it begins with love. And it's not yours or mine, it's God's love for you and your love for God that the more we love God, the more we can love one another. Let me say that a little differently. The deeper the relationship of love with God, the deeper the relationship of love we can have with our spouse. Let us pray. Lord God, we pray for a growing relationship of love with you. Lord, when we come into worship and we spend those first moments singing, in many places that's called worship time, and later in the service is teaching time. In that worship time, help us to connect to you to love, pure and simple, to feel your love radiating down on us and our love rising up to you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength and mind. Love. Because that kind of love sees us through the brokenness. That kind of sacrificial love sees us to the next level. That kind of love gives marriages that are 40, 50, 60, 70 years long that kind of love forgives. That kind of love never lets go. Lord, we pray that your love would shine down on those who have been affected by Hurricane Dorian. Especially, Lord, I look at the utter devastation that we see in the Bahamas and that your love would be poured through your people throughout the world to bring aid and support to people so desperately in need and that the people in our own country would have their lives restored from the damage of the storm. Lord, we pray as we remember that this week uh, is an anniversary of September 11th. We pray, Lord, that you would so fill this world with your love that we would be infused with a compassionate love for our neighbor. We pray, Lord, where for that day when nations can stand beside each other and not battle with one another where religions can stand side by side and not fight, where people can work together to support one another instead of destroy one another. We look for a world that can live in peace and love 
and we look for a world, Lord, that reflects your will and your ways. Now we ask that you would remember us in your kingdom and teach us as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.